Well, we're going to talk a little bit about um, agency and instructional design. The idea here is that we're going to elevate the conversation a little bit. Um, instructional design, as I learned it, as you've learned parts of it, um, as We've discovered that around the world, most instructional designers have become acquainted with it, um, is taught rather traditionally uh, and as a process where uh, instructional design is considered as a, a linear, systematic, and, and fairly prescriptive approach, saying, you know, you do this, then you do that, you do it kind of in this order if you can, and you really ought to look after all these things, and uh, here's how you do that when you do. Um, we also know that traditionally uh, instructional design has been considered something that can be applied um, neutrally to learning environments and in isolation from learning contexts. And what I mean by that is that, that the process of instructional design would apply no matter what you're trying to apply it to. Um, and we've found that sometimes that's not the, the fit isn't always exact. Um, then, what, because what we've discovered, of course, is that actual ID practice, after we learned about it as a linear process, even though we've barked time and time again, don't consider it linear. It's not linear. We know it's not linear. It's very context sensitive. But as much as you say that, the you know it still looks like a linear process, and it's how we how how we approach it at the beginning. Well, when you start practicing instructional design, there's there's no more uncertainty about it. You find that uh, in practice, instructional design varies with the context, uh, uh, the things you do, the order you do them in, all of the considerations that you have are uh, shaken up quite a bit from the traditional way it's sometimes taught. And we also have to wonder about its alignment with the design sciences. Um, uh, is instructional design as traditionally taught and practiced aligned with design science? Another entirely um, significant area to be considered. Okay, but what, what we want to talk about today is approaching instructional design from a completely different angle and saying, all right, you practice all this stuff. When you're, when you're embedded in the practice of instructional design, it becomes way more. You are doing a lot more than the processes. You're doing a lot more than just uh, defining learning outcomes and, and designing some activities and evaluations that fit with those. Okay. You're doing a whole lot more than front-end analysis and then some usability testing at the end. What you're doing is acting as an agent and performing in an arena of moral practice. Because your agency, when you're performing as an instructional designer, the point we want to make is that um, it, it implies a power relationship. You're making decisions that uh, about content, about relative importance and sequence of content. You're, uh, uh, you're working with clients in particular ways that, that, uh, that adjust their approach to what is being taught and how it's created. And so when you create stuff in that kind of an arena, um, uh, you're exercising power. Um, and we know that instructional designer agency, if you're going to be an agent for something, when you're performing at an agentic level, um, that's most powerful when you're working from a foundation of moral coherence. When your moral um, fabric aligns with the work you're doing. Um, Moral coherence happens when a designer's values align with those of the clients and the institutions for which they work. Uh, and you don't always have that, um, that luxury. Uh, sometimes you're working in, uh, in 
your status is one of moral incoherence. <laughs> so there's a continuum of how closely you align uh, and your agency aligns with the stuff that you're, you're doing a lot of times as an instructional designer. We wanted to look into that. that uh, 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 Katie Campbell and Rick Kenny and I uh, uh, started looking into uh, just these kinds of questions. Like, how does that really, how do, how do instructional designers understand this stuff? Um, and how do they express it? And what can they teach us about it? Uh, and we did it with a shirk funded um, uh, study. We had about um, approximately 50 conversations with about 20 different in instructional designers from around the world, uh, most Canadian. Um, uh, we conducted this uh, as a narrative inquiry. I'll get into that a little bit later in a storying of experience. Like, tell us a story about when that happened, you know. And we wanted to capture their uh, cultural constructions of experience, their experience as instructional designers, uh, some seminal personal and professional encounters, those really key uh, uh, um, moments that galvanized some things that they, they learned about themselves and their practice and what they were doing morally and, and ethically and, and how that then affected their moral and ethical development and um, their own understanding of their work as instructional designers. So we wanted to get into all of that by, um, by talking with designers through with narrative inquiry. Now, why narrative inquiry? Well, because uh, socially constructed practice is, uh, uh, by its very nature, equal to socially constructed description. Okay, so uh, it it fit in that way, and it mimics na narrative inquiry. Mimics natural conversations. You have natural conversations with people, and that's precisely what we wanted because we knew we were going into territory that sometimes people acted on and knew about, but they hadn't really ever thought about deeply. And so we needed to have a conversation to kind of, uh, uh, kind, kind of coax out some of that thinking around some of the deeper issues that we were looking at here. And narrative inquiry, uh, narrative implies a relationship and a moral dimension uh, with action learning, and it locates narratives and and develops a social history, social geography, and contextual and shared commentary. So we were after all of those kinds of things. But we were especially interested in narrative because it was important for community building and practical reasoning. And we wanted personal perspectives and semantic innovation. We wanted, we wanted to develop um, uh, people's sensitivity to the meaning of what they're doing. And so uh, uh, it became uh, a, a very useful uh, approach, methodology, uh, to apply in this case. But one of the other reasons is because design is active. Your design is something you do. It's not just something you talk about and sit back and, and think great thoughts and, and, and have wonderful reasoning going on behind it. You're, you're active. You're doing things. And... In that activity, you often discover some of the deeper meanings uh, uh, that come out. Um, and so narrative has a moral, emotional, aesthetic, and intellectual dimension to it. So uh, in all of those cases, it's very round. It allows you to look at a number of different uh, uh, angles. Because if narrative has a moral, emotional, aesthetic, and intellectual dimension, so does ID. Instructional design has moral, emotional, aesthetic, and, and intellectual dimensions that we explore all the time. And so we wanted to use this uh, opportunity to go into it more deeply. In the end, I'll jump to the, to the end of what we, what we learned. We could express it as a model. It really was just a way to illustrate what we found out from these various conversations with people, how they expressed their, their agency and, and uh, their, their, um, uh, their identities as instructional designers, how it came out. Um, we developed that, and I'll, I'll walk you through this. It's, it's, it looks more complex than it really is. Um, uh, uh, the, the model itself, though, did seem to capture 
a pretty good sense of the range of, of conversations we were having and the relative importance of various things that came out around um, moral agency and instructional design. Okay, piece by piece. One thing is interpersonal agency. Now that was one of the things that seemed to come out. Well, we noticed uh, when people were talking, when they were telling stories, uh, they were talking about interpersonal relationships with clients and with learners. And in interpersonal agency, we see um, a bi-directional, okay, you working with others, moral commitment to people involved in projects. You've, our instructional designers talked about deep commitment they had to their clients and to the learners who ultimately were going to, uh, to experience whatever they created. And we found that to be uh, very warming. Uh, we weren't surprised by it, but we were very warmed by how it came out so clearly in um, in the orientation of, of the instructional designers we spoke with. Um, they had their emphasis was on collegial engagement and advocacy for learners. They really felt uh, that they were learner advocates. And, and one quote that just jumped out at me that, that uh, said that so beautifully was somebody who said, I need to be the learner before there is one. I design for people who don't usually have a voice in what happens to them in their educational lives. And I have to be their voice until they can speak for themselves. Oh, I've never he heard a clearer statement of, of agency and interpersonal agency that adopts the, the position and the responsibility to the learner quite so well. Um, another type of agency we found was professional agency. People felt, instructional designers, felt a responsibility to the profession. Okay, They're professionals. I mean, you can imagine, dentists feel they, they have a responsibility to be good dentists, good doctors, good doctors. Uh, they owe that to the profession. Uh, good teachers feel great responsibility to the teaching profession. Uh, and so do instructional designers. Instructional designers had the same kind of, uh, a kind of agency. They felt a responsibility to their profession and they uh, and they felt a responsibility to act in professionally competent and ethical ways. Okay, one person said, "I need I needed to synthesize a wide range of experiences and educational considerations in order to make decisions." So they saw that all of those had to make decisions that were consistent with those. Uh, I often felt the the need to vet these decisions with experienced designers. However, also, I also needed to prove that I was capable of being a designer in my own right. Finding an appropriate balance was a challenge. So people felt that responsibility to go talk to instructional designers about what was going on because they knew in the profession people with experience could counsel them well. But also that, that growing into the professional mantle of being an instructional designer was a theme that came up over and over again. Um, then we had institutional agency. Um, institutional agency was expressed in a number of number of ways. People felt responsibilities to the institutions uh, they worked in. So uh, uh, you feel a responsibility to your school, to your division. Um, I would feel a responsibility to uh, uh, the University of Saskatchewan when I do things, when I'm working as a designer with them, and certainly those things play out in, in very important ways. Um, it considers the way that instructional designers align their work with the institutional goals. So if your division has a particular mission that aligns with what you are doing, or that, that needs to align with what you're doing, you take that very seriously about trying to bring it into, into that alignment. It's not always easy. Um, it may be expressed sometimes, that institutional agency can, it may be expressed in a tension felt between the organizational goals and personal values. You know, sometimes you're working on something and you feel a very, very important responsibility uh, uh, to express what you're doing with them even though uh, what you're doing in alignment with institutional values even though you feel that it's in conflict with your personal values and sometimes you feel that you need to I don't know not subversively but you need to inculcate 
um, your personal values sometimes, if you feel that they have a professional, they have professional weight and importance into those, the interpretation of those organi organizational goals, uh, that's tricky business. Um, so one person said there are some really huge issues that are moving forward in distance education, and especially technology enhanced learning issues. Okay, if the institutions the academies in this case, do not look at these issues very seriously very soon, they're, not, they're going to find themselves in a policy netherland where nothing works. So people are very worried about how those institutional policies are going to play out if they don't, uh, if, if they don't handle their work uh, exceptionally well. So you have also then an even higher level of agency that came out. When we talk to designers, they said, you know, one of the other things that we need to deal with is societal agency. Um, we need, uh, and, and do, we have, do, do we have social influence immediately with what we do and impact in the jobs that we're doing? And do we have enduring influence? Does what we do matter to society? That was a big deal to people. They worried about that social agency more than they expressed it, however. They needed to know that they were contributing to more um, a more significant social societal influence and they sometimes felt a disconnect between their perceived responsibility and the authority to influence change so sometimes they didn't feel like they were in a position to make the kinds of differences they felt a very strong need to make so uh, one expression of this was it's it's one of those things where you feel you uh, feel you know you make a difference you know you have an impact at times and sometimes you come away feeling really good about it but rarely do I feel like it's a consistent difference so I'm more frustrated than I am satisfied with the level of difference I make I'm always looking to have an impact okay um, really really important um, for we suspect now this didn't come out in the research because we were talking to uh, practicing instructional designers so they were all in the biz at the time but that's something i'd like to chase down with people who have left the profession who've gone on to do other things whether or not that was a key reason that that feeling that they weren't having the the social or societal level of ag uh, agency um, that they felt was very important to their to their own satisfaction as professionals, and I wonder if people who leave the profession don't don't express that. But don't take the don't write that down. That isn't something we found. It's something that I wonder about, though. Hey, there's a good thesis in that. All right, these things can play out. The dimensions of agency can play out in a lot of different ways. There are intentional dimensions, and there are operational dimensions. And I won't go into great detail on these. However, intentional dimensions of agency are really just related to principles or values associated with actions. Okay, um, It's what you intend to do and deciding which things are more important and with those things that we mean to do. Here's what I intend to do. Here's what I intend to, con uh, to, to accomplish with this. So you're making, as an instructional designer, you're making, all the time, you're making personal judgments about what's significant or preferential or moral or ethical, what you're going to emphasize, what you're going to de-emphasize, uh, what you're going to try and leave off the, push off the edge of the table, um, uh, what you'll make room for and what you won't, and what sequence and power and authority will you give each of those messages. It comes up a lot. But there's, it comes with a risk of making design decisions that are inconsistent with uh, um, the underlying intentions of the work. Okay, so if somebody hired you to um, uh, let's say build something for um, um, in the oil patch to do some training around. Um, uh, 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 I don't know, uh, ecological influences of the work there. Well, you may have particular feelings about that, and you may be making design decisions that are subtly critical or align the importance of um, 
making ecological decisions that uh, are inconsistent with the values of the uh, company, say, that hired you to put it together. That kind of thing is dangerous. Uh, you're making decisions that go beyond sometimes your immediate role and you're taking on some responsibilities and some authority that maybe you weren't given. And uh, so you have to do that really carefully. It's not saying that you shouldn't when or how uh, is more important and how you bring the clients and the organizations along with you when you make those kinds of decisions is also very, very important. But that's the intentional dimension. My intentional, the, the intentional dimension of my in, uh, agency in that case would be to promote um, uh, uh, an eco-friendly uh, model of working in the oil patch uh, that moves on. Now, is that, that if that's your intentional dimension of your agency, how then uh, can you express it? Well, that's the operational dimension of the agency. The operational dimension of agency is now, how do you play that out? If that's what you intend to do, if that's really what you, what you feel is important, how do you then express that? How, do, how will that be manifest in the work you do? So there are practical implications or expressions of particular intentions, principles, or values. So you can probably see that you're dealing with, in operational dimensions now, those concrete actions or outcomes. How do you design it? How do you sequence things? Those various decisions that are made and implemented, how do you do that? Those are the operational dimensions. And Several operational expressions can be consistent with a single intentional dimension. So if, if you want to present an eco-friendly uh, face of, of, uh, of the oil industry, well, there are a lot of different approaches you can take to create that, to express that friendly face. Uh, it could be happy clients or uh, 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 landscapes that are green and full of fauna and flora just jumping around. Uh, but I mean, you see what I mean. There are lots of different ways that you can express the kinds of uh, intention. A single intentional dimension can play out in a lot of operational ways. But all of this happens within a, what we call a zone of moral coherence. It means when it, that zone is where you align interpersonally, professionally, societally, institutionally with the with all, what you're doing with all of those other uh, yeah, levels of agency, those other types of agency. So you've got that zone, and that zone of moral coherence is a great place to work. That's We found that when instructional designers were working in a zone of moral coherence, they felt very comfortable in what they were doing. But the, they started to feel really uncomfortable, and they felt the greatest tension in their jobs, or I don't know the greatest, they felt great tension in their jobs, though, when they were operating outside that zone of moral coherence. So there are also interactions among those types of agency, and we'll get, we won't go into that much, but the professional can interact with the interpersonal, so the societal and interpersonal can certainly interact, and your professional agency and your institutional agency are seemingly at war with each other or cooperating with each other all the time. I mean, uh, yeah, for instance, your, your institutions uh, where you work, say you work in a school division, um, and you have a strong professional agency for educational technology and, and uh, uh, the integration of educational technology in what you do. Um, now, does that align with the institutional agency that you feel? Is the, does the agency's, does your division love educational technology and invest in it? Do they support your work? Uh, those kinds of things can either be in conflict or they can be in support of one another. And when you have those kinds of interactions, it creates a whole bunch of interesting things that can play out uh, that we talked with instructional designers about. I don't think any of that's any surprise to you. But with that, there's uh, a micro level agency, small. Uh, there's macro or, or meso level agency, much higher. Uh, there's um, uh, there, and there's macro, which is huge. Um, so micro, meso, and macro levels of agency, not really an important concept with what, what, you're, 
what you're worrying about here. Although you will be playing things out in, in those zones all the time. All right. Do I have advice to the to instructional designers? Yeah, you bet we do based on this research. Um, and our advice, we could go on for days and days and days actually. But I think some of the big lessons that came out of the research were that first of all, it underscored how, very importantly that instructional design is a social practice and it's not the rote application of instructional models. It's not taking the ADDI model and plunking it into a context and working through things and spitting them out the other side. It's no surprise. That's not the way we teach it. That's not the way any of the ADDI model or any of them are supposed to be used. But this really did reinforce that if that were the orientation, it would be a bad one. Um, another big lesson was that change agency, if, you're, if you see yourself as a change agent, um, that involves moral relationships. And those relationships are so critical, they just kept coming up. Your relationships with the profession and the institution, but so importantly with the client and, and, and with the learners, ultimately. Um, uh, so your actions are not value neutral. When you do something as an instructional designer, it has influence. It has, it, it has valence. It is one way or another. You're emphasizing one thing or another. Your, your actions carry values and express them. And um, our advice to instructional designers is to consider how in, in, intentional and operational dimensions of design may conflict. That whole notion of what you hope to do and what you have to do is critical. Uh, you're often working with clients who have the authority to decide ultimately what goes and what doesn't. They're paying. And so uh, you have to negotiate that in particular ways, particularly if you find your way, yourself in conflict with, with a client or an institutional set of values. My advice to you as grad students is, for one thing, avoid like the plague an exclusive focus on the mastery of tools. Yeah, that's the fun stuff. Knowing how to do a good needs assessment is great. Knowing how to set up a usability test and and uh, gather data systematically and then the excitement of that and learning how to how, how to do those kinds of terrific stuff. Um, learning the, uh, 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 how to use various uh, video tools and things like that. Great fun. No learning how to build things online. Couldn't, couldn't, couldn't enjoy myself more when I'm doing that kind of thing. There's nothing wrong with that. Uh, there's nothing wrong with with Addy and systematic design and some of the things that we've learned there. But just avoid the exclusive focus on that. Once you have a mastery of those tools, that's a starting point. That's not. You, you, that's not where the real authority and the lasting influence of what you do is going to be felt. So engage yourself early and often and throughout your careers in identity work. Always think about who you are as an instructional designer. What are your values? How do you want to express them? What are your limits? What won't you do no matter what? What is the job you would walk away from? and why, and when, and under what conditions. So you can do a list a number of things here that you can do to do that from autobiographical work, uh, writing to, to um, working on cases and social uh, 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 kinds of networking that you can do. To, but the important thing is that you engage yourself in the work and that you never get satisfied that that identity work is finished. It's an ongoing process. It's one of the more exciting parts of being an instructional designer for the long haul is that you get to know so deeply who you are and how that person you've become, those values that you have, express themselves in what you do.